Euromax highlights in today's show. Iconic images, unguarded moments in Robert Labeck's celebrity photographs. Fashion Frenzy, the Allude label presents its latest collection at the Berlin Fashion Week. Musical managers, German executives learn about teamwork in an orchestra. Euromax highlights, and here's your host, Karin Helmstedt. Hello, and a warm and sultry welcome to our Highlights edition. And we head off today in a rather modest little car that has become nothing less than an icon. Indeed, it's hard to imagine Italy without its Fiat Cinquecento, a cozy little two-cylinder car that was launched in Turin in 1957. It redefined urban mobility for the masses and rolled off the production lines 3.7 million times until 1975. Well, every year in Garlenda on the Italian Riviera, fans of the original model gather to celebrate their favorite wheels, and we were there for a leisure ride through part of Italy's national heritage. Fiat 500s as far as the eye can see. More than a thousand Cinquecentos descended on Garlenda, including some unique modifications, converted convertibles, souped up sporty versions, and imaginatively revamped station wagons. For three days, Cinquecento drivers formed a convoy along the Ligurian coast. It's an event Carlo Giuliani of Savona wouldn't miss for anything. The nice thing about driving this car is that it lets me experience a time before I was even born. You enter into a constant, intensive dialogue with this car. It replies to every command you give it, and you have to answer back. But the car's two-cylinder, 13.5-horsepower engine requires regular cleaning and maintenance. Still, Carlo has three of them in his garage. The Fiat 500 has to be started with a crank, which is located between the seats. The car was designed by Dante Giacosa in 1957. To make the vehicle and its history better known, Carlo and other Cinquecento fans have set up a museum in Garlenda. People who'd only been able to afford a motorcycle could suddenly drive a car. This emancipation of mobility changed Italy entirely. The museum shows the history of the car which sold for the equivalent of 6,000 euros in the 1950s. It was three meters long with room for four passengers and their luggage. The design remained virtually unchanged until 1975. In 2007, a retro model was introduced, the Fiat 500 Nuova. But that version is not allowed on the grounds of the Cinquecento Festival in Garlenda. I'm really disappointed. I'm really a fan of the Cinquecento, and I'm even thinking about buying one of the old ones. But most of the festival goers are purists. The old one, you, uh, it's, it's, it's a very basic car. It's, it's just what you need to drive, and the new one, it looks a little bit like the old 500, but no, it's, it's quite other car. It's, it's new, it's, it's more comfortable. The other one's a good substitute, but you wouldn't want to drive one instead of one of these. Huh? The new one has a lot of similarities with the old one, but unleashing real emotions that really get under your skin, that's something only the classic can do. Real emotions. That's exactly what the festival in Garlenda is all about. Tours of the Ligurian coastline are offered for Fiat 500 fans heading toward Nice, weaving through narrow streets and picturesque villages. The Cinquecento can't go faster than 100 kilometers an hour anyway. This car has the incredible ability to slow things down, a kind of internal harmony. Going through the fresh air without air conditioning, you get a lot closer to nature that way. You can't get that with a modern car. It's almost like becoming one with nature. And that's true, especially in Italy, where the Fiat Cinquecento is still very much on the road, a part of the Dolce Vita. 
Well, a far cry from the Dolce Vita is the typical atmosphere at the Berlin Fashion Week. This past week, the capital was literally swarming with fashionistas, from journalists to models, fashion buyers and designers. Well, Euromax accompanied the Munich-based designer Andrea Karg and her label Allude through the entire process of preparing and showing off her latest collection, taking in the highs and the lows that go on behind the scenes of a successful show. It's the big moment for every designer, the presentation of the new collection. For Alude's head designer, Andrea Karg, it's the culmination of months of hard work. Six days earlier, final preparations are being made in the label's Munich Atelier. Together with her team, Andrea is making decisions about which pieces go together best. We've worked on this for so long, and we're going to see how it now looks on the model. Of course, we've tried it before, but this is where we really start to work on the detail. Should it be blue or a different color? It's great. There are still so many variations to try. No, I think I would. No. No. I, th I think, no, I think leather is leather for the pockets and for this, and I don't, I, I would not mix it there. I, I so only cashmere see. Yeah. with this color? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I put down the color number. Okay. No, I don't see the leather there. 35, 70. Soll man nicht, das finde ich jetzt langweilig. 31 outfits have been carefully packed up for transport to Berlin. The fruits of six months of labor by the Allude team are entrusted to the movers. It's a great feeling. We're finally on our way. We're clearing everything out of Munich, packing things safely away, and we'll meet up again in Berlin. It feels wonderful. Now it's nearly showtime. Just three days to go till the Allude collection arrives in Berlin. Time now for the casting of the models. From the mark, please step forward, wait three seconds, and then back again. Andrea Karg is looking for 20 models for her show. She'll look at dozens over the next two days. She has something refreshing. Somehow I really like that. But she's 1 meter 81. The right girls need to have the right assets. They need to have the right look, but also attitude matters. Inner qualities are important. A beautiful face alone is not enough. They have to have presence and attitude up on the catwalk. That's really important. The official opening of the Berlin Fashion Week. Just one day to go before the Allude show. Now it's crunch time for Allude. Models for the show have been cast, and stylist Samuel Drira is looking through the collection to find the right look for each girl walking the runway the next day. It's the best moment and the best part of the whole process, because you see how it fits the model, and how it falls when the model moves. It's just really, really great. A few hours later, it's time for the makeup test. All the makeup artists, because we don't just have one, there's 10 or 11 chairs here, they have to know what we want. So today, we're making a master picture so that everyone knows what to do. After the last show of the day, a lewd boss Andrea Karg still needs to inspect the multimedia wall for her company's show. It should start where the A is now ending at the top, right? <laughs> I saw how the technical side functions and that the concept would really work, because until now it was only in my head, not in the space. Now I've seen it on the wall, and I'm really confident that it will work. I think it's brilliant. It's a lot of fun. 
The big day has arrived, and it's time for Andrea Karg to show her new collection to the world. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, I'm giving the call. Two minutes. No, that's us, oh, okay. okay. Right now, I could lay down and cry, to be honest. The tension is draining, and even though I'm very excited, I also feel extremely tearful because it was all so tense, and now it's over, and I can let go. Back in the early 1950s, Robert Lebeck from Berlin had no idea what he wanted to be. But as luck had it, his first wife gave him a camera as a gift, and that was the first step to a remarkable career. Learning by doing, he went on to become one of Germany's most renowned photojournalists, and perhaps his greatest talent was always being in the right place at exactly the right time. Well, now a new exhibition in Bremen shows off some of his most famous pictures. Faces from around the world, casual moments captured in dozens of countries. All by Robert Lebeck, one of Germany's last great photojournalists. Then there are his portraits of Klaus Kinski, Romy Schneider, and Joseph Beuys. These images are brought together in a major retrospective in Bremen. Lebeck, now 81 years old, attended the opening. Robert Lebeck lives in retirement in Berlin. His career spanned five decades. Often, he was in the right place at the right time. Like in 1960, when a bystander at the celebrations of Congo's independence stole the Belgian king's scabbard. The König von Belgien was gerade angekommen. The Belgian king had just touched down. I thought, if I go to the airport, what picture will I get? At best, he could fall down the stairs, but he won't. So I didn't go. But the other journalists did, and their bus drove into a ditch on the way back, and they all got stuck. So no one else was there. His image became the symbol for Africa breaking with its colonial past. It kick-started Lebeck's career. He photographed the rich and famous for the influential weekly Stern. He kept his charm, but followed one clear principle. Get the photo first, then worry about scruples. Lebeck never shied away from seizing the moment. If an opportunity was there, he took it. Like one night in 1968, when he photographed Jackie Kennedy and her sister by the coffin of Robert Kennedy. On the way back to my hotel, I saw a limousine stop in front of my taxi with the windows blacked out. Two ladies in veils got out. I told my driver to stop. I jumped out and went in. The bodyguard spotted me, of course, and I didn't want to push it. So after 10 photos, they waved, and I had to split. To get the right photo, Lebeck often relied on his wits. For a series on the trip to Kosovo by then-Chancellor Gerhard Schröder, he wanted access to Schröder's helicopter. He pretended to be a government spokesman, whose name badge he took from the press plane. Everyone had their names on their seats, on these adhesive labels. I thought, maybe I can use that. When we were getting off, I just stuck the guy's name badge on my sweater. All of a sudden, I was part of the inner circle. I was allowed in Schroeder's helicopter, and that was vital. It was the only way I could get the photo of Schroeder over Kosovo. From the beginning, Lebeck knew how to get his way with people and win their trust. It helped him get this intimate shot of then-German Chancellor Willy Brandt. 
He also built up a special relationship with actress Romy Schneider. She liked me and I liked her. That was clear from the start. I could try out whatever I wanted with her. She gave me a free hand. She knew that if some were unflattering, I wouldn't use them. The exhibition in Bremen is a comprehensive retrospective of the work of the Berlin photographer many historical figures came to trust. Some reporters used to say, Bob would just grin. And maybe they were right. Maybe the grin helped me along. Of course, it's no use anymore. Grinning doesn't help when you're 80. But that trademark grin shows no sign of leaving Robert Lebeck just yet. Well, no doubt all of their competitors are wondering just how they do it, because the German design firm E15 just keeps on raking in the awards. The company works with prize-winning designers to turn out furniture that places its accent on timeless modernity and an understated luxury. Well, this unwavering strategy has just picked up a coveted Red Dot Design Award. No superfluous frills, instead clear purest lines. Most furniture produced by E15 is made from solid oak. Metal and glass also feature in the collection. The German firm has won many design prizes for its sleek, pared down aesthetic. The latest coup, the CH4 Houdini by Stefan Dietz has won a Red Dot Award. Commissioned by E15, the company wanted a timeless look that matched the rest of their range. On no account should it be decorative or stylish. It has to be authentic. You shouldn't design for design's sake. You have to produce something honest that almost looks as if it has always been there. Philip Mainzer is the force behind E15. He's the company's co-founder, managing director and creative director. The 40-year-old studied design and architecture and has a reputation for being a perfectionist. Mainzer set up the firm 15 years ago in London. Soon he moved to Oberursel near Frankfurt. What remained was the name E15 for East 15, the postcode of his London workshop. Mainzer's design is trend-setting. For me, it's a part of this sculptural theme, that every piece of furniture is not just a purely functional element, but an object that the user has to live with and identify with. Solid wood tables are one of the hallmarks of E15. They're produced in Germany and sold around the world. They're typically made of European oak, as was one of Philip Mainz's pioneering works, the stool or side table Backenzahn or molar tooth. The idea of Backenzahn is really the basic idea of our material theme. The material is taken as it is, as it grows, and is then processed. E15 commissions well-known designers to complement its line. The shelves by Arik Levy from Israel, or the lamp by British designer Mark Holmes, both won Red Dot Design Awards. Now they've been joined by Stefan Dietz's Houdini, an organic form made of thin, curved wood. The designer developed the process himself. I wanted to achieve a very comfortable, three-dimensional form with very simple elements. You can't really bend the wood three-dimensionally. You would have to really violate it. There are techniques that allow you to do it, but then it looks like plastic. And that was the challenge for me. When the chair made from plywood with an oak veneer proved popular, Stefan Dietz created an entire collection of furniture in the same style. E15 named them after friends and relatives of Houdini. 
Eugène, for example, is one of the first names of his French role model, Robert Audin. The sofa, Bess, which I'm sitting on, was his wife, for instance. His wife was called Bess, that is. And so we try to create small links. Perhaps Houdini's nearest and dearest will also win a design trophy. The original model could soon bag another award. It's also been nominated for the German Design Award 2011. Great stuff. Well, finally, on most days, they are used to being the leaders. Yet once a year, they let go of the reins and let someone else take over. The Management Symphony is an annual event that brings together some 90 business executives, management consultants and various academics to play in an orchestra and perform in Leipzig's famous Gewandhaus Concert Hall. A different kind of challenge for the players and our reporter was there. Colombian conductor Andres Orozco Estrada is the one setting the tone today. His musicians are playing Johannes Brahms' Symphony No. 1 in C minor at Leipzig's Gewandhaus Concert Hall. Normally only professional musicians play here, but today some of Germany's top business executives are joining their ranks. One of them is Christoph Meisch, co-owner and CEO of a building supplies firm. I'm happy to come to Leipzig every year and see control to a fabulous conductor like Mr. Orozco Estrada. I can let loose, forget the daily grind and only think about music and the symphony. It's great fun. It's four weeks before the concert at his factory in the spa town of Baden-Baden. Here, Meisch heads a company with 400 employees. His grandfather founded the firm back in 1903. The family business produces steel components exported around the world. Maish often works 12-hour days. For him, classical music is the perfect contrast to the din of factory life. I work late, but it's fun. When the results are good, you do it gladly. And at the end of the day, you know the viola's waiting. He's got lots of practicing to do and not much time left before the concert. Brahms Symphony No. 1 features lots of solo parts, so the timing must be just right. <laughs> Maish began playing the viola at age 13. He even performed in James Last's big band orchestra. So the Leipzig concert is the perfect incentive to practice. It can get crazy. If I've just come back from a business trip, then I might stand here practicing at 11 at night, because you want to be well prepared. Back at the Gewandhaus in Leipzig, it's the final rehearsal before the big concert. The managers have been rehearsing for three days without pay. In fact, they've even paid for the privilege of performing with a well-known conductor like Andres Orozco Estrada. Don't play the second eighth note too early. The Colombian conducts orchestras around the globe. Soon he'll accompany the Mahler Chamber Orchestra on their tour of South America. But this is the first time he's directed an orchestra of amateurs. The major difference between a professional orchestra and, let's call it a music lover's orchestra, is you sense that everyone is filled with joy and a desire to give it their all. That's not always the case with a professional orchestra. Mr. Orozco Estrada inspires us with his fiery South American temperament, even if you're only playing second fiddle, or in my case, viola. The concert starts in 15 minutes and the auditorium is filling up. Soon the managers will test their mettle in front of a paying audience. Backstage, excitement is building. Sure, there's a lot of excitement and everyone's looking forward to the concert. You're not nervous, but there's a positive tension because now the chips are down. Brahms Symphony No. 1 is a demanding work, even for professional musicians.
Lots of applause and bravos for the managers. It was worth all the effort for this moment alone. And we've come to another moment. Before we go, don't forget that you can watch many of our reports again on our website. And there's plenty of other information to be found there too. That's all for this edition of our highlights. So thanks very much for watching. Until we meet again, bye-bye and tschüss.